Well, it's it's isn't it extraordinary that a a, a very senior and respected official like that uh, can offer that hypothesis uh, in in a very plausible way? Uh, we know that the CIA uh, has uh, run jihadists. This is uh, not at all a secret. Uh, it's kept out of uh, the New York Times, let's say. It's kept out of the mainstream media, but it's uh, not at all a secret to those who follow these events. We uh, have uh, reason to suspect that this uh, particular crocus uh, attack was uh, linked to uh, Ukraine uh, in some way, uh, because, uh, of course, the perpetrators were fleeing to Ukraine, and they have uh, told the Russian investigators that they were expected to be received in Kiev. We know that the United States knew a lot about this attack. How? Uh, it hasn't told us. It's so strange, actually, uh, that uh, the U.S. acknowledges well, it knew. It, it actually gave a warning, uh, albeit a couple of weeks uh, beforehand, uh, about uh, an attack like this about to take place. How? Why doesn't it explain? Why isn't there more understanding? It all gives rise to the kind of speculation of uh, Lawrence Wilkerson, very plausible, uh, and uh, what senior Russian officials are saying. As we discuss all the time, the U.S. government lies so relentlessly that whether or not this particular claim is true, it certainly could be true, and nothing that the United States government has done since this attack has allayed these suspicions, uh, nor has it dissuaded very senior Russian officials from making such assertions, though the Russian uh, leaders and investigators have said that it's an ongoing investigation. So it's dismaying uh, and impressive to hear uh, Lawrence Wilkerson speak in this way, very measured, very reasonable, obviously deeply experienced, and very worrisome. You... Um have been uh, harshly critical of uh, the, some, many of the dastardly deeds that the CIA has been uh, involved in, secret wars, secret uh, army, secret uh, coups. I've joined that criticism. Uh, the, your colleagues on this program have, the, the viewers have uh, applauded the intellectual honesty that exposes that. But tell me, Professor Sachs, are these American CIA agents so indifferent to innocent human life, so heedless of basic moral standards, so reckless in their disregard for international law and American federal law, that they would facilitate the killing of 144 young people at a concert in order to make some kind of a point to the Russian president? I don't know. Uh, I, I really don't know the answer to that. I, I do know that uh, the CIA uh, organizationally uh, takes uh, uh, missions to destabilize adversaries or perceived adversaries of the United States. Uh, those actions have resulted in vast uh, numbers of deaths uh, over uh, the decades. Uh, so this is uh, uh, what the CIA uh, does uh, in part. Remember, as uh, we've always discussed, of course, it's two organizations in one, which is right. uh, its, its profound failing of design. It's a secret army that aims at destabilization. And there's no doubt, we know it even in this case from the New York Times story recently, that the CIA operated in Ukraine with the purpose of destabilizing Russia. That was not a surprise to, to read, but it was a surprise to read it in the pages of the New York Times a right. few weeks ago. Uh, but that has been an ongoing mission of the CIA for decades. So 
I would say everything is possible. It is really important for the American people to understand that the CIA has been publicly investigated precisely one time. And that was 49 years ago. Frank Church. The Church Committee in 1975, we will be at the 50th anniversary next year. There has not been one occasion since then in which the actions of the CIA have been independently investigated by even another branch of government, much less true independent investigation with access to the facts. When you have a secret army that is unaccountable to the public, unaccountable to the Congress, operates for decades, operates under presidential orders that are once in a while exposed, but then even so not discussed, you can have all sorts of results. Let me give one quick example, which is one of the most under-discussed facts of uh, our modern times. And that is that President Obama tasked the CIA with the overthrow of Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. And we know that from, I think, two stories in the New York Times, as well as the other ways that one learns about these things uh, in, in diplomatic circles. And this is almost completely undiscussed that Basically, Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, and the CIA launched a war in Syria that has been going on now for more than a dozen years. What kind of review has there been of this? None. What kind of public debate has there been of this? None. How many lives have been lost? A lot more than in the Crocus Hall. Uh, So you ask... Could the CIA do this? Of course, the CIA could do this. And in the case of Syria, the implications have been hundreds of thousands of deaths. What kind of review do we have of this? None. And by the way, as bizarre as our public discussion is, and so often infantile, our leaders point to Russia for intervening in Syria Mm. But that was years after the United States CIA started that war and armed the jihadists, by the way, because that was one of the cases where we armed uh, militant jihadists for the purpose of overthrowing a government. So, yes, of course, it's possible. Do we know the facts? No, we don't know the facts. Are we going to be told the facts? No. But one thing I would like to put on the table is that at the 50th anniversary of the church committee, it's high time we have another investigation of what this organization has been doing for the last 50 years, because in my view, it has put all of our lives in peril. Here, 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 Professor. Um, The Pope recently called you in from New York to ask your opinion on uh, matters involving uh, the sustainability of life on Earth and things planned at the UN uh, in the fall. Of course, my hat is off to you. Uh, If Speaker Mike Johnson called you in and said, oh, Professor Sachs, we can't decide what to do with the $61 billion authorization for Ukraine that came over from the Senate a few months ago, what would you tell him? I would tell him, Speaker, please uh, understand the current situation that more money for Ukraine means more destruction of Ukraine. The longer uh, this Biden war on Ukraine continues, because it is a war and it is on Ukraine, it's destroying Ukraine. The longer that this continues, the worse the outcome for Ukraine. What Ukraine needs is not $61 billion of American taxpayer money down the drain. What Ukraine needs is a phone call from President Biden to President Putin to say, you know, it's time 
we sit down and uh, end this thing. And the reason I say that is that this is a war that was provoked by the United States and by Obama and Biden and Clinton uh, and others uh, already 10 years ago, uh, starting with a uh, an idea uh, that is about 30 years old, that U.S. Uh, military forces would uh, take their positions in Ukraine on uh, the Russian border through NATO. This was a reckless uh, gamble that was propounded uh, again almost 30 years ago. It was spelled out carefully uh, by Zbigniew Brzezinski in 1997. The gambit was that if uh, the U.S. and NATO uh, would expand uh, to Ukraine, this would end Russia's status as, as a great power because it would surround Russia essentially in the Black Sea. Biden has been part of this. Uh, it, it was uh, reckless. Every senior diplomat, including our current CIA director, uh, then our U.S. ambassador to Russia in 2008, knew how reckless this was. European leaders said to me privately how reckless uh, this idea was back in 2008. Um, but this idea of expanding NATO to Ukraine uh, is seen by Russia as an existential threat, and Russia will continue to fight against that basically a proxy war against the United States, uh, as long as the United States continues to push this. Now, many people have made this observation in the last two, three years. Uh, John Mearsheimer made it uh, precisely back in 2014. Uh, George Kennan said that expanding NATO would be the worst mistake in the post-Cold War era, one that would be absolutely uh, fateful and uh, fatal uh, in fact, uh, he wrote this back in 1997 in the New York Times. And until this moment, this remains the U.S. doctrine. It's unbelievable. Just uh, last week, Blinken said again, NATO will expand to Ukraine. In other words, Ukraine will continue to be pummeled uh, continue to lose territory, continue to lose thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of young men and women in Ukraine to this U.S. reckless, stupid, irresponsible gamble. So I would say to Speaker Johnson, you don't help Ukraine by sending $61 billion. You certainly don't help the American people and the U.S. taxpayer you don't help sanity in U.S. politics. Why, I would ask him, would you want to bail out uh, the failed politics of President Biden at this moment? Uh, because this was a, a gambit uh, of Biden and Obama and uh, uh, Hillary Clinton uh, that goes back a decade. Why at this moment, Mr. Speaker, would you want to try to bail that out to somehow disguise this uh, debacle till after November makes no sense politically, financially, militarily, strategically. It's certainly not in the help of Ukraine. What will help Ukraine is negotiations between the United States and Russia on a direct basis of responsibility to end the war, to end a war that was provoked by U.S intentions to expand militarily to Russia's border and seen as an existential threat by Russia as a result. Here, a, a great statement, uh, Jeff, and I didn't even tell you ahead of time that I was going to ask you that as articulate and complete as you always are. Uh, just to raise your blood pressure a little bit, here's the statement that you referred to made by a hand wringing, as always, Secretary uh, Blinken, uh, with I believe the uh, Ukrainian foreign minister standing next to him about Ukraine joining NATO. Uh, Ukraine will become a member uh, of NATO. Uh, our purpose at the summit is to help build a bridge to that membership. Uh 
It's just it's crazy it, that they still embrace this view after all that's happened in the past two years. It, it is so incredibly irresponsible, the lack of diplomacy. Why uh, President Biden and President Putin are not speaking? You know, President Biden spoke with President Xi Jinping last week, uh, and that is a good thing. He needs to speak with President Putin as well. They need to find a resolution of this before Ukraine is completely destroyed, as it is being destroyed now every day. Of course, Russia is advancing a across the front lines uh, on typical days. Hundreds or more than a thousand Ukrainians uh, are dying because of Russia's uh, vast superiority in artillery and complete superiority uh, in air power and hypersonic missiles and the rest. Uh, Ukraine is losing on the battlefield, but it's uh, losing uh, exactly what we claim to be trying to defend because uh, President Biden won't acknowledge this is a failed gambit. This is uh, playing a bad hand terribly, continuing to raise the stakes on a failed hand. And uh, maybe one can understand that from uh, Biden's extremely personal point of view, but from the point of view of Ukraine, from the point of view of the American people, the taxpayers, the U.S. Congress, it makes no sense. Uh, transitioning, um, uh, two or three days ago, uh, a, an Israeli journalist revealed the existence of an AI uh, program employed by the ADF called Lavender, and this is apparently the means by which the uh, IDF decided who to kill. They, the program assigned a number to suspected members of Hamas from one to a hundred. Hundred was, you know, must be killed. One is, we're not sure, and the other numbers in between. And wherever this person happened to be, the uh, computers uh, sent dumb bombs, not smart bombs, to the house and didn't care that it killed uh, family members and, uh, and neighbors as well. Or even gave explicit allowance for that. How much, uh, how many collateral deaths, uh, uh, g given uh, the targets and so forth. Correct. I mean, do you expect, uh, that, uh, the Netanyahu government will try to shed blame or insulate or shield itself from blame saying the computers did it? I mean, this is just, Another example, in my view, I'm anxious to hear your uh, thoughts, Professor Sachs, of the reckless criminal nature in which this war uh, has been uh, executed with the knowing and deliberate slaughter of everybody around the target, even the target's children and grandchildren. Yeah, I think that there are several points uh, here. Uh, first of all, Israel is surely committing war crimes up to and including uh, the crime of genocide. Uh, so uh, those are human choices uh, because we have the most extremist uh, zealots uh, in the Israeli government who have a vision of ethnic cleansing or slaughter uh, in some pursuit of uh, what they call greater Israel. So. At, at the core of this is politics uh, and destructive politics leading to massive war crimes. But uh, there's the other element, uh, which is uh, the rapid infusion of advanced technologies uh, in killing in a completely uh, it, it, horrific, uh, alarming way, but also illustrating how cutting edge technologies get militarized and without uh, any governance, ethics, civility, public knowledge, public awareness. So there's a, a general phenomenon here. It's happening, of course, with the US military. It's happening uh, in Ukraine. It's happening uh, in Gaza. Uh, 
it's happening uh, reportedly uh, with the uh, nuclear war gaming uh, and uh, even uh, no doubt, well, I won't say no doubt, but uh, most likely with the programming of uh, uh, nuclear weapons reactions and so forth, we are infusing it with uh, artificial intelligence uh, in ways that is extraordinarily dangerous, in this case, in Israel, criminal uh, and uh, cruel. But with these technologies advancing so quickly, with governments that are not accountable to ethics or to the public, this is uh, astounding and alarming. If I could uh, make a, just a quick digression, which seems uh, maybe completely uh, uh, out of uh, left field, but I think it's related. You know, my own view is that most likely uh, the the COVID pandemic was developed uh, by a U.S. research program uh, funded by the NIH uh, in a highly secretive uh, research program uh, that was manipulating dangerous uh, pathogenic viruses, making them more dangerous. The reason it's related, in my view, is that we are in a moment of extraordinarily rapidly advancing technologies. Uh, even the biotech and the AI build on the same underlying digital uh, technologies and platforms in a way. Uh, but the fact of the matter is uh, these are out of control. They are militarized. They are extraordinarily dangerous. And we don't have any governance uh, within our countries or internationally uh, in which ethics and uh, the, the common good are maintained in the face of uh, this uh, relentless militarization, whether it's of pathogens or whether it's of artificial intelligence. So what's happening in Israel is uh, uh, can be viewed uh, at a political level, uh, but it can also be viewed at a technological level level that's uh, both are, are terrifying and and it can be viewed of course on a moral level professor Sachs, my my hat is off to you i stand up and salute you if you were here i would hug and kiss you for the courage uh, intellectual bravery and acumen uh with which you just uh, explained a view that i know you have held and on which you've done a lot of research and on which you've uh, given a lot of uh talks uh, with respect to the uh, COVID uh, pandemic, we, we will we will well publicize for you what you just so nicely yes. summarized. Last topic before we go. I appreciate if I if I may, before we turn to the last topic, just let me give you one little snippet uh, more uh, uh, about uh, AI and, sure. and the military. And that was uh, just a, a typical event. I was at a security conference uh, in Bratislava. Uh, uh, Slovakia um, recently, and uh, this question of AI and militarization came up, and it was a, a discussion on stage of uh, some NATO generals, and their point was not, this is a dangerous and runaway technology, or how can we get it under control, or what kind of diplomacy. The entire talk was, we'll beat the Chinese in this, we'll beat the Chinese in this, we can stay ahead. This is how generals think. Maybe it's right for generals to think that way, but it's not right for governments and diplomats uh, and the public to think this way. Uh, and the generals must not be in charge. But their view was, well, we're just in another arms race. So we're going to maximize, accelerate in every way the deployment of these extraordinarily dangerous tools without any consideration for diplomacy, for ethics, uh, for safety, for what can go wrong. And so this phenomenon that we see in Israel now, this phenomenon of uh, the uh, so-called biodefense, whatever that is, but manipulation of uh, dangerous pathogens uh, and the bravado and stupidity, I would say, of these generals thinking, ah, oh, we'll, we'll be ahead of our adversaries, mm. uh, as if this is the only approach to the dangers that we face is is really 
all around us. That's what I wanted to emphasize. Well, n nicely put. And as you mentioned, generals, it's a transition to uh, my last topic with you uh, this morning. Uh, why are there several hundred American troops on a small island off the coast of Taiwan? What are they doing there? Are these war games? Are they provocation? Are they a tripwire? Well, they're definitely a provocation, uh, whether advertent or inadvertent. It's completely shocking that Americans have uh, troops uh, in uh, an island of Taiwan, which the United States recognizes as part of China, against the expressed, and I would say alarmed, point of view of uh, the Chinese leadership. What are we doing? How many wars do we want to be engaged in? Where is even the modicum, the minimum, the iota of prudence in our behavior? It doesn't exist right now. That's exactly what we saw Blinken doing. No awareness, it seems, of the red lines of other nations. In the call, by the way, between uh, President Biden and President Xi Jinping, uh, in the Chinese readout, the uh, strongest language by far was the Chinese expression made during the call that Taiwan is the reddest of red lines. Mm. And you know, the, the deepest failure of American foreign policy is the expressed denial of red lines of anyone else besides us. This is where we go wrong in an absolutely devastating way. We simply could not hear that the Russians were concerned about NATO coming up to their 2,000 kilometer border with Ukraine. Nah, nothing to worry about, said these fools in our government. Well, it's the same in Taiwan. We don't want to hear. The Chinese are telling us something very serious, very real, and given their history and their geography, very understandable, which is that Taiwan is a red line the United States recognized this in a communique more than 40 years ago when it said it would not arm Taiwan for the long term. It was going to taper off what had been support upon the diplomatic uh, uh, relations uh, with the PRC. We do not live up to that. We don't even want to hear about red lines. I suggest we learn to listen.